task of this session is, is fairly simple. I'm going to describe how ICT technology can be used to remove one of the uh, concerns that we've been expressing over the past few days, allow us to have free movement while securing our borders, and um, using technology as well to solve some of the political and social challenges that the region faces. Because as you all know, technology is a cure all for all of the things that we, we, we are facing. Or so they say. But not actually so, because if we have to talk about this whole ICT factor in the context of, of free movement, uh, there, there are a number of, of issues that separate the promise of ICT and technology, you know, the systems that we use, the technology and the devices that we employ, the people that use it. There are a number of issues that separate that promise from the operating reality. I think for most of us, we have um, deployments of technology at various levels, at border protection, customs, immigration, and that there has been a press, a push, a, a force, almost a twisting of the arm to use more technology. Uh, but the technology by itself is not actually solving some of the more vexing challenges that we've been discussing over the past few days. So what I want to do in this, um, in this presentation as we, we lead into the, the vendor presentations is to, to take a look at the context within which we're being asked to use more technology and to take a look at the context within which we are being expected to apply it to address the issue of free movement. So the, the start point for me is, is for us to look not just at what's happening within the region but what's happening uh, globally and to use that to, to give us a sense of you know, what does it really mean for us and how does that context allow us to be more relevant and more effective. Uh, that's why we have established the Caribbean community. We have been hearing this for decades. There is a regional integration imperative and that imperative allows us to define our place and our relevance in the world. Now, there is also a global imperative and we have been, we have been on the receiving end of that force for some time now. Uh, this was an interesting statement made by, uh, or in a report to the European Commission, and it said effective control of cross-border activities is nearly impossible in regimes in which, to remain viable, they have to keep their borders open to goods, capital, and services. And a lot of the tension in the conversations this week have been uh, between that imperative to integrate for survival and this other almost impossible requirement to have open borders but yet secure. Have free movement but yet, yet police and monitor and track who is coming in and who is going out. And inside of that tension, there are a number of issues that, that we have to apply ourselves to. And a number of issues that we, if we consider them carefully, actually allow us to start to understand what is, and I call it this, what is appropriate or relevant application of information communications technology. And I think for all of us, we, we, we come to the epiphany that technology by itself is not going to cure any of our core challenges. We've come to the epiphany that technology is not a cure all it's not a magic bullet, it's not one of those cases where if you buy the right system or get the right thing, suddenly all of the challenges will disappear. So let's take a look at the, the global context. Uh, again, I just, I'm putting some statements up here, and I think we can all relate to them. We are inside of a world in which, whether it's through your smartphone, through the internet, through cloud computing, through any one of these acronyms that are being held at us, from voice over IP to TCP IP to IPv6 or whatever it is, technology has transformed life around us. And in that transformation, uh, there are some factors that for our governments, for our territories, for our communities, we can't think of any dimension of development or security or collaboration or coordination without thinking of some kind of underlying supporting technology um, function in the mix. So that's the place that we are at. We have to deal with it, like it or not, whether you are technophobe or technophile, we have to interface with technology at some point to advance our development agenda. And that's a fact of the context that we are inside of. But at the same time, at our borders, we're looking at general increases in trade and travel. We're looking at more complex cargo supply chains and rough. We're looking at serious and in some cases very well funded international criminal activity taking place across and between our borders. 
We're looking at cyber threats, which most of our societies are still not yet in a position to effectively grapple with. And we're looking at officer integrity issues that came up several times this morning, corruption, uh, graft, and so on, and then, of course, constraints and funding. You know, there's not a perfect environment, but this is what we have to work with. Right? This is what we have to work with. This is the reality of the, the situation around us. Now, while all of that is happening, remember the societal change is also still swooning around us. While all of that is happening, and this is where you can put on your citizen hat as well, we have this expectation that in any service we access now should be as easy as Google or Facebook or YouTube. We should be able to use cards or currency or mobile payments. We should be able to access all of the transactions that we have using the available technology. Now, what that is doing, while we grapple with our procedural issues, it's creating a, a cynicism, a, a growing disquiet amongst the, the consumers of the services that we provide. And I think services as in when they pass through our airports, when they arrive at our ports, when they land at our gates. And um, that cynicism, that mounting frustration, that can't be treated with by any one agency. That's not an OECS commission challenge or government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines challenge. That's a regional challenge. Because we have, and that expectation, that, that transformed understanding of what I am entitled to when I interface with a system is not just with the foreigners coming in on the cruise ships or on the planes, but with our own citizens. Uh, some of you may or may not know the statistics, this region is actually one of the most per capita, one of the most um, dense regions for Facebook users. Right? So we have more Facebook users per capita than most other regions, even developing regions, even developed regions. Uh, what that means in essence is that Facebook actually knows more about the behaviors, the appetites, the interests of our citizens than our governments do. That's the reality that we get. In that context, that mounting negativity and cynicism gets propagated at speeds that previous service we could not imagine. So a frustrating experience at one point suddenly becomes a Facebook post that gets reposted, reshared, retweeted, um, <laughs> re-Instagrammed. <laughs> right? And what that does, it amplifies disaffection with our slowness act, or the disaffection with our lethargy in changing and transforming our business processes. All of that is part of the context within which we consider um, the, the system. So I put this, this diagram here to give you a, a kind of visual picture. You know, some of us like to, to, to see the pictures. On one side, we have the treaty and the promise. Free movement is an enshrined right in the revised Treaty of Assetia. We've been saying that, we've been touting it, the OECS has been promoting it. But then, as we do it several times over the course of the, 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 the few days, <laughs> They meet this environmental reality. The border official, the customs <laughs> officer, the immigration officer, who is not quite as convinced as to your right to move freely into and out of his other jurisdiction. Right? But we have this noise, we have this noise coming from the politicians, the noise coming from our institutions that free movement, OECS, integration. Wonderful Nirvana for all. And then we have slapping in the face at every point where that is not a reality, this contention to realize the promise. Now, again, that's not just the, the officers, that's the way the system treats with you. They're filling out the form. They're filling out the form with the same information multiple times in different places. They're filling out the form knowing that you already filled out the form online when you did your online booking to provide the same information by people who know Amazon one click. You have my profile. Why do you need me to tell you again what I've already told you? And why in the same form do I need to tell you again what I told you in the form above? And again the cynicism mumps and the disaffection mumps and the agitation mumps. While we grapple with should you let them pass or not. <laughs> so I call it the frustration gap, that distance between the promise of the treaty and actually it's more than a promise, it's a legal commitment between the member states and the reality 
that those who interface with the system have to deal with at the points where our systems haven't quite caught up with our intentions. So we have to mind that gap. And we have to be conscious of that gap as we look at how we treat with this issue of what is appropriate, what is relevant information and communication technology. All with me so far, right? Yeah. yeah. So in this context, we in this room and in rooms like these become the central conduits, the channels, the interfaces between those who are seeking to legitimately move to and fro across the region and, um, and their destination, their intention. We are the conduit between that experience. And I was talking yesterday to someone about creating a user experience that is seamless, that is intuitive, that is almost enjoyable. I like when I pass through and I landed without intervention, unnecessary uh, interruption of my movement. We become that conduit. The decisions we make and take and the, the actions that we, we, are, we have are the ones that determine if this becomes a reality. And I added some words to free and secure. I say freely, conveniently, and securely pass. Because I think we need to, to, to put that into the uh, into the determination. Why are we doing that? Why well, all the free, convenient, and secure is taking place? We still have a right to clamp down, shut down, keep out, push out those who seek to do the region harm. But the thing that is supposed to be bigger in our minds is this responsibility. <coughs> because if you look at the statistics, that in fact is the majority of the traveling and moving public, not this. And a lot of the discourse and, 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 the, and the public perception is out of the reality that, hey, you are treating with me as if I am a criminal by default before you treat with me as if I'm a citizen by default. Mm -hmm. And we have to understand the, 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 the philosophical dichotomy of that position. And what it is doing again in mounting the frustration, the aggression, the cynicism around our sincerity to actually allow for free movement. Now we're still talking technology because at the end of the day technology itself is not going to be the reason why anything changes. It's going to be people. And technology ultimately becomes this, the, the, the servant, if you will, of the vision of a people. So the things that we use the technology for have to be defined by what we're ultimately trying to do. So, so let's agree on the end game. This came up yesterday. We have to have an end game inside. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Jude said it this way. If we, if we want to tackle this elephant, we have to take it one bite at a time. <laughs> so I want to outline for you, as we, and this is, we're going to have a chance to chat again this afternoon, but I want to outline this morning uh, a set of considerations around uh, <coughs> what we're trying to achieve and how we can position the technology to enable that, um, those objectives to be achieved. So our aim is to protect the borders. I think there is no disagreement on that whatsoever. Our aim is to safely and efficiently manage the movement of people and goods across our borders. Can I get an email on that? I think we have consensus on that as well too. But while we're doing that, we have to also be conscious that we're trying to... This is to get to something else, right? So if you pull away the layers on safe and efficient management of movement and people. What we're ultimately trying to do is to strengthen national and regional security. What we're ultimately trying to do is enhance economic opportunity. What we're ultimately trying to do is to empower and enable our society. And I think if we have these as anchor positions, it actually allows us to take a look at how the policy implementation part of it actually affects it. So if in trying to be so secure, we actually frustrate business people moving around the region, then we have compromised our ultimate objective. If in trying to be so complete with our procedure, we frustrate uh, people's movement and ability to move, then we're actually shortchanging ourselves as it relates to realizing all of the opportunities. And so, if we put the list down this way, objective shaping action, Free movement of goods, people, and services designed to, one, facilitate development of economic activities. 
Now, these are not necessarily primary concerns of the individual officer at the port, but I'm saying that that officer has to be aware that these are the high-level concerns that all of this policy making is designed to allow us to achieve. And that consciousness then allows them to exercise more appropriate discretion in protecting the borders and in facilitating the movement of people and goods. So we're trying to enhance the opportunities, foster closer relationships, amplify strength, and I'm going to repeat this one several times um, today, amplify strength, capacity and capability, and improve our global competitiveness. A set of phrases that we've heard often that we can now put into our, our foundation. So, before we can have any kind of real coordinated, harmonized approach, we have to settle the debate on what exactly is free movement. How free is free? Hmm. Mm -hmm. And if you realize, in the, again, the tension of the discussions over the past few days, we don't all have the same opinion on how free free movement ought to be. Hmm. Which then makes it fairly difficult for us to make decisions around what technology, what system, what policies will enable this unequal or heterogeneous view of free movement. So how free is free? What's it is our user experience? We want them to feel the full weight of security scrutiny or we want them to feel the relief of knowing that they're moving as citizens of one economic zone. You see, those are, those are important um, considerations. What are the consequences of inaction? Now, again, someone raised the, the Myri case in, the, um, in Barbados, which wasn't quite a free movement, but what it did, it put a whole new legal spotlight on the compliance responsibilities of treaty signatories. Now, I've been in some conversations over the past few months where we have lawyers actively looking now to see if they can enrich themselves by finding any <laughs> disaffected regional travelers. You know, sometimes you go to the States and you see these guys advertising. Have you been, do you have a back pain? Were you in an accident? Did you slip and fall in a mall? 1 800, call me lawyer. Right? That business is finding its way to our show. <laughs> have you been stopped at the port? Are you a member of the, the OECS community? Have you found yourself treated ill at the borders? Alright? Alright? Did, <laughs> Did you lose your baggage? Did you lose your baggage? You need <laughs> So, so I want us to understand, this is coming on track because, again, context, the, the, the understanding of what the entitlements are, are now being propagated in a way that they haven't been propagated before. Before we could have whispered, you know, we really supposed to have free movement, but we don't want you to know how we really supposed to move. Now they could broadcast it on YouTube. <laughs> Do you know that you are entitled to stay for six months at least? And you see, all these things change where people will now be challenging the system looking for you to stop them, yeah. so that that's the world that we are doing into. Mm -hmm. I really want us to understand the, 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 the context. It's not just an internet and YouTube thing. It's a sharing of information thing. It's a new sense of a regional identity that is separate and apart from the political sense. It's a, I know I have rights, and now I'm starting to understand what I can do to exercise them. Right? So there are consequences for not just in action, I put it in brackets, but it could be out of brackets for insufficient action as we move forward. So, building blocks, as I said, I'm just going to outline some stuff and then, uh, then we, we call the session a close. Conviction of the integration imperative, clarity of national purpose, commitment to common standards, co-investment. I just put these as, as things that we can, we can use as a matrix to assess, okay, where are we exactly? on the free movement continuum. And these are essential elements to moving toward the technology innovation. Conviction on the integration imperative. And when I say conviction, not just for you, for the officers on the, for the institutions and the, 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 the groups around you. Clarity, commitment to standards, knowledge sharing. And all of these things, this is not just a pretty slide. This is, this is stuff that you can actually drill into and look at what systems do I need to ensure that there, is, there are common standards. What is knowledge sharing? Qualified, right? What is capacity building? Institutionalized. So that's, that's why I want us to look at these blocks as, as things we can then pull up and say, okay, where are we with this? What's the nature of our 
knowledge sharing policy or practice? What is the nature of our co-investment to leverage resources? I'm going to enter into a new contract for my water management system. Come, let us talk about what you did in your contract, how much you paid, what terms and conditions you used so that when I sit to negotiate, I'm not sitting as me and my limited country resources, I'm sitting as we. You see, all of those things start to point to how these blocks start to apply themselves in the real world. And again, the catalyst is people. Right? With that conviction, people with that vision, people with that same sense of, you know what, this is not just a political policy saying that we need to have free movement. I understand what the implications of this are for economic growth, social empowerment, development of entrepreneurial opportunities, etc., etc. And for that, if we have to talk about what systems we're using, then we also have to have an awareness of what's the mentality, investment that also needs to be made. I think that came up this morning in the in the security presentation. The investment in ensuring that we have the right mentality to go with the right technology. And that's the key. So seizing the opportunity, and I'll, I'll stop um, with these, I'll skip past these, and get to, to this point. A significant opportunity exists for us to leverage existing knowledge, expertise, and technology. Now, the way I want, I want us to look at it is as if we're dealing with an ecosystem, right? So we have technology as an enabler, but technology is a servant to our vision and our ambitions. So if we have a clarified sense of what those ambitions are, <laughs> clarified meaning beyond the, the gray areas of, for example, what is free movement and how free is free, if we have a clarified understanding, then we could have a coordinated approach to investing in ICT. This presentation is not about how to run a water management system <coughs> and how to look at uh, immigration um, best practices. It's about how to leverage our collective understanding and investment for regional good. <coughs> so, in the center, leadership, no surprise. These are just blocks, and I'll talk about the, the ecosystem right after. <coughs> Partnerships, people, policy research, training, infrastructure, finance, blocks. Again, to give us a sense of if we have to evaluate where we are in our ability and readiness and our capacity to take advantage of any systems integration, what are the things we need to look at and pay attention to? It will be these. And the ecosystem will look something like this. And again, in the discussions yesterday, there were a number of people talking about, for example, the system too slow, I don't have enough bandwidth. We don't have enough devices or computers, our staff under appropriately trained. Technology needs infrastructure. Right? And infrastructure in this case for our, our purposes would be the nature of our broadband networks, the investment in the hardware and software. Uh, something called the Internet Exchange Point, which you may or may not have heard about, but essentially what it does is it allows us to route secure traffic within our border without sending it outside of our country or region unnecessarily. Right? All of those are things that have to be in place for us to really play with the big boys as it relates to technology. Or we will forever be subservient or dependent or consumers of someone else's technology. So that infrastructure component is important. On top of it, we have the HR development component the indigenous innovation. And I, I want to put this here because for every big system out there, you will have somebody, a government or some institution tell you, you have to have this system. You know, really, I want to help you because you, you are, because you need to be helped. And they will offer you a system. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. And they will offer you a system because, well, it's just the best and it comes from a developed country. But then, for all of the big systems that we have, border, immigration, you have the little system, the database that tells you who are the other customs officers that you need to talk to. The little watch list that you have developed because you know you're looking for particular kinds of people in your particular area that sit around these, these systems, almost like satellites. And inside of that, and if you know the history of some of these big systems that we use, they're just companies of five or ten people working on what they understand and what they know in some other place, some metropole place. But we have and we have several examples of this across this region, not just the Caribbean, this sub-region. We actually have the capacity to put systems in place to do that management securely, scalably. 
And you have to understand, just like somebody sending a system to you creates economic opportunity back wherever they come from, that same economic activity could be anchored right here as part of the capacity building and strengthening. You know the difference between a maintenance call that says I'll send somebody next week and a phone call that says I'll be right over. Right? And when we're talking about critical systems, this becomes an important part of our investment in what we're trying to achieve. Collaboration, well, I'm talking up about that, particularly in the current context of, of, um, of the integration movement. I put service excellence up here for us to consider, where we're actually looking at metrics that define things like wait times, transfer times, uh, processing times, and we're sharing it with a view to optimizing our ability to service stakeholders that we, we, are, we are mandated to, to serve. Policies and standards, procurement and maintenance. That's the ecosystem. That's the thing with, in which when you say, I'm looking at a passport system, it has to fit in that context. So somebody can sell you a passport system, but do you know you have, if you have the best contract? Do you know if your terms are better or worse than the country right across the street? Do you know what maintenance is going to look like? Do you know if you own your data? Do you know if you had a change to make how much of that intellectual property, even though they're coming to interview you, would remain valuable to you? or to the vendor. You see, those become the issues that we have to contend with. And that's what I'm saying. When we cry on one hand about lack of resource and lack of funding and so on, on the other hand, if you, and statistics become so important here, if you qualify and quantify the cost of our outsourced solutions on a country-by-country -country basis, you realize that we have paid many, 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 many times over for a solution that could have worked for all of us and given us the consistent policy and the consistent practice and the exact functionality that we're going for. I want us to be very clear on that. So when I put this in ecosystem up here, the blocks are real blocks. It's like these are the human beings behind these blocks, the decisions that have to be taken behind these blocks. And these blocks ultimately allow us to achieve what we're going for. Right, so five enablers and then I close, yeah. We want to go for data-driven, intelligence-led, risk-based approach to decision-making, which means for all of the systems that we deploy, we deploy, we have to ensure that, one, there are reports that can go to a common repository that allows to do national and regional level analyses of what is the exact state of free movement, both in terms of goods and services. So that becomes an important functional component in any system that we, we, we have. I asked for some statistics yesterday, and it's difficult for us to get things, for example, how many aggregated uh, containers came in, how many were inspected, how many actually resulted in um, illegal goods or services being trafficked. When you have those figures, you can make informed decisions about what is the appropriate level of investment in policy, bureaucracy, and security practice. You might find that only X percent, where X is less than 5, of your containers actually have something that you need to be concerned about, but you're spending 90% of your resources looking for the something. Right? And I'm sure all of us have our stories, seeing grandmothers, um, special dental toothpaste taken away at the airport because they didn't know the travel side restriction and they were going on a 30-minute flight. But the customer officer insists that that tube of toothpaste must go. Okay? So the statistics help us understand where the energy should really go. And so we look at that as a need. Law one, second, credible, consistent approach to client service. I'm suggesting that we define standards for quality service that allow us to, to have metrics that we can aim for in terms of processing times, queue times, etc. That will then allow us to, in a harmonized way, say we are doing our best to ensure that there is free movement and hold each other accountable in that regard. Be nimble and innovative in execution, pursue collaborative partnerships, embody a policy of professionalism. All right? And these are all framed around these four points, protect, facilitate, advance, and lead. As I said, this is part one of two. I hope, I hope this has been a useful context as we get ready to listen to the, the, the better presentations. We have to know the context within which our technology investment decisions are being made and how they align themselves to our ultimate goal for free movement across the OECS. Thank you.